morning everyone. Welcome to oh, can everyone turn? Okay. Sure. Speak as loud as you can. Okay. Welcome to uh, Apache Con uh, North America in yeah, 2017. And uh, Netflix. Who doesn't know Netflix here? <laughs> That's good. Huh? So uh, I'm sure all of you here are uh, one way or other Netflix subscriber, maybe sharing a friend's account or maybe staying on your own. <laughs> but um, if you are not a customer, I can start a little sales pitch. But uh, since everyone is a customer here, I can get into our topic. Stranger Things, um, one of the Netflix version shows released last year. Yeah. I was um, watch. I heard about this uh, show on a hallway conversation with my colleague. And then um, I started watching it on a late evening, um, on a lazy day, on a couch, uh, on my iPad. Uh, of course, I didn't start this show with an intention of binging it overnight or completing it on the next day. I just started casually. But uh, all the Stranger Things fans out there, uh, you all know how tough that would be to stop this in the middle uh, you know, without binging it the whole day. So I completed about uh, three episodes and then uh, my iPad uh, battery died. Then uh, I had to move to our uh, TV room and continue watching on uh, on our TV. Uh, interesting thing there when I stopped uh, when my battery died on uh, iPad and then moved to TV and when I opened uh, Stranger Things, I didn't spend any time rewinding, uh, going forward, figuring out where I left off. It just resumed where I paused. I think a couple of hours into that, uh, you know, I was still hungry. Uh, you know, I wanted to get some popcorn and drinks. Then uh, I took a uh, little errand to get some drinks. Well, the interesting thing is I couldn't stop watching it, so I started watching it on an iPhone on a traffic route. Uh, the same thing. I didn't spend any time. <laughs> so I didn't spend any time figuring out um, where to continue. I just opened my uh, Netflix app on an iPhone and opened uh, Stranger Things. It just resumed where I left off. Why? What makes it possible? What makes the seamless movie experience uh, while you are watching something and uh, switching the devices? And uh, that's called Netflix. Oh, hello. Does anyone copy? So this is one of the great features that Netflix has, uh, which basically records all the heartbeats of your player uh, in the background and resumes where it left off. And uh, what makes it possible to get uh, right in front of your screen what you like most uh, is called Netflix recommendations. It uh, basically uh, records all your view history and your rating history figures out which shows, which movies you might like best. And also, we store a lot of uh, customer information about uh, uh, what you paused, what you rated, where you paused, where, how long you paused, paused, and how many uh, shows you binge, everything. And uh, most of these features, almost all of the features that uh, that Netflix has, directly or indirectly, depends on uh, an amazing persistent store uh, that is Cassandra. Well, that's what our topic today. We'll talk about Cassandra serving Netflix at scale. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce myself. I'm Vinay Chala, Cassandra MVP and a Cloud Data Architect, part of uh, Cloud Database Engineering team at Netflix. Uh, CDE team we call internally. Uh, we, our, our team is responsible for providing several persistent stores as a service to the rest of Netflix uh, application teams. Uh, apart from Cassandra, we provide several other services as a, a, a several other data stores as services, uh, which includes uh, Elasticsearch, Dynamite, and RDS, MySQL, Zookeeper, and uh, all the client libraries, Tooling, uh, which, which supports uh, any of these data stores. Uh, we'll talk about uh, specifically Apache Cassandra uh, at Netflix 
and what all the challenges we face in providing Cassandra as a service to the application teams and uh, how, how do we certify and benchmark it and how do we make it production ready uh, you know, to be deployed in the production environment. Getting into the details of Cassandra uh, at Netflix, uh, almost everything is stored in Cassandra, not the movies, except the movies, everything like metadata about movies, uh, customer information, viewing history, rating, billing and payments, everything is uh, being persisted. Uh, in terms of footprint, we have uh, hundreds of clusters with uh, tens of thousands of nodes uh, making several petabytes of data and uh, serving several millions of transactions per second just out of Cassandra. So on a high level, I um, have categorized uh, challenges that we faced across several years in providing uh, Apache Cassandra as a service uh, at Netflix, uh, monitoring, uh, maintenance, benchmarking Apache Cassandra and uh, making it production ready uh, to be deployed in uh, Netflix ecosystem. So in today's talk, I'll uh, get into specifics of these challenges and uh, how we solve those, uh, how we came up, uh, how we built systems and what systems we built to get around these challenges. So let's uh, first tackle uh, monitoring issues or challenges in monitoring uh, generally talking about uh, persistent stores or the distributed stores uh, and I'll get into details of Cassandra here. Uh, so before getting into the, that, uh, let's see what we monitor. Uh, we monitor latencies. Uh, we monitor latencies uh, in terms of read latencies, write latencies, uh, 99th and 95th. Uh, we don't monitor average latencies and um, when we monitor 99th and 95th uh, coordinator latencies, uh, one of the critical thing is not every Cassandra cluster gives you the same amount of um, uh, you know performance because uh, in terms of Cassandra, it majorly depends on what kind of data you are uh, storing, how you are accessing, and uh, your usage pattern and access pattern, data model, and several other things. So, key important thing here is we don't uh, blindly come up with a number and uh, enforce that number on every cluster. So we have uh, SLAs defined based on cluster configurations. And all, all of our tooling and monitoring uh, goes off of that. And uh, we monitor health of the Cassandra, uh, which includes uh, gossip status, nodes uh, perspective about all of other nodes, and uh, client protocols that are running you know, thrift and binary and also any networking issues on the machine or any hardware issues on the machine. And uh, since Cassandra is a Java-based uh, system, uh, we also monitor JVM and heap of the Cassandra. And apart from that, we also look at uh, what recent maintenances that have been running on Cassandra. Um, maybe it's a user-initiated uh, maintenance or a system-initiated maintenances. And um, another critical thing that we do monitor is uh, wide rows, uh, with mainly with the Cassandra, um, how long, how large your partition actually decides your cluster behavior. So we do uh, keep a look at uh, wide row or wide partition metrics, and um, we also look at a um, lot of uh, system warnings and in information messages and errors are being logged in Cassandra system logs. So we do monitor uh, logs as well. So the first question that uh, comes to anyone's, minds, anyone's mind when you have tens of thousands of instances is to how do we even monitor those thousands of instances? And the common approach would be a cron-based system or a job runner which uh, wakes up on a schedule and reaches out to your thousands of instances and uh, comes up with a, something called a state of the system or the health, check, health state. Uh, at any given point in time, uh, let's call it a T0 snapshot, um, the entire Cassandra cluster of 1,000 nodes looks healthy. And then uh, since it's a cron-based system, you would deploy something like this. You have, uh, I, I took an example of Jenkins. Uh, you have a Jenkins slave or Jenkins master uh, that is being deployed in one data center. Um, and uh, you have several data centers or several regions where your actual uh, 
database or data systems are being deployed. So your Jenkins system reaches out to all of your Cassandra instances and figures out health of a Cassandra. But uh, the typical problems with the common approach and common architecture uh, would be, since they are uh, uh, cron-based systems or job runners, they do not persist any state. Uh, but the, the database or the system that we are dealing with is not a stateless system. It's a stateful system which uh, has an importance for the state and the transition that every cluster goes through. And being in a cloud uh, native system, all of your, many of your nodes experience uh, network glitches or you know, uh, bad hardware, bad network, or maybe an, a transient issue or maybe a critical issue. But you do need to understand the state of a system uh, to assess the health of a system. So let me take a uh, common scenario uh, and uh, explain the problems that are involved uh, when building uh, something like a you know cron based uh, health check system so let's say at a t0 uh, your cron based system wakes up and reaches out to thousands of instances and figures out uh, the cluster is healthy and then uh, again it wakes up at t1 and tries to figure out if the cluster is healthy or not uh, but at t1 when is it when it is reaching out to thousands of instances maybe a couple of instances might be ex experiencing a transient uh, network uh, glitch or maybe some you know s system is under pressure whatever then uh, instead of uh, giving up you just uh, sleep for maybe you know 10 seconds and uh, retry again and when you are retrying this time maybe some other instances are experiencing the network hiccup then uh, you sleep again so that would that would be a never ending problem then you come up with some uh, you know hacky algorithm to figure out what nodes are actually having an issue and what nodes are experiencing real issue. But these are just workarounds on top of workarounds. And um, another issue with the cron-based systems is let's say your system is under pressure and you're trying to establish a connection to find out the health of a system. But um, you cannot establish a connection to figure out health of a node because system is already under pressure and your health check system fails when you need it most. And also, since these uh, cron-based systems would not have any state of the cluster of what, I what has happened and what is going to happen in the future, what is going on right now, uh, they, would be they would not be uh, resilient for any uh, temporary network glitches or any temporary JVM pressure and stuff like that. And uh, these systems would not scale when you are going from uh, 1,000 nodes to 10,000 nodes to 100,000 nodes. And we, we, we initially had a system something like this, and uh, which did not serve our needs as we were scaling out. And that is when we uh, took a step back and thought about the problem in a, in a different way. What if we had a fine-grained snapshots of health of every instance that is being pushed out on a persistent connection instead of establishing a connection and figuring out the state uh, at any given snapshot. So simply instead of a, a pole-based approach, something like a push-based approach, where all of your instances, thousands and thousands of instances, would send heartbeats to a centralized or a distributed, central, a distributed system uh, which figures out the health uh, of your overall cluster. So that is when we thought about something like a streaming system. We looked around. And um, we found out uh, that there is already a, a system built in-house uh, which serves exactly same needs that we were looking for, uh, which is um, uh, high throughput, low latency, operational uh, streaming system uh, that is called Mantis, uh, which is again uh, our open source offering. Um, I think it's, it's yet to be open sourced in next month in this quarter. Uh, but Mantis streaming system is basically built on top of uh, Apache Mesos, uh, provides a flexible programming model uh, in a ReactiveX, um, and also it models your computations as a DAX, and um, which is basically designed for uh, operational uh, insights. So uh, by rethinking the traditional uh, cron-based health check system in a streaming-based system, this is how 
the uh, topology, the architecture of a health check system looks like. You have uh, thousands and thousands of instances sending heartbeats to something called a source job. Uh, source job is a terminology that I took from uh, Mantis framework. Uh, job uh, in a Mantis framework is not actually a, a, you know, a scheduled job or something like that. It's a microservice uh, which is um, built on top of a reactive uh, programming model uh, which which collects uh, heartbeats from every instance that is out there and uh, builds something called a message um, that is being sent to our own job that we wrote on top of Mantis framework. Uh, so we have uh, called it a local ring aggregator. And the reason, uh, and the reason we have uh, three different local ring aggregators here, I took an example of three data centers. And uh, when you are sending um, you know, heartbeats every 20 seconds uh, from thousands of instances, and we were talking about uh, almost um, 60 MB per second of data that is being transmitted just for the health check. And uh, transmitting that much amount of data cross region was expensive and was not reliable. So that is when we built um, isolated uh, local ring aggregator for every region. Uh, the main purpose of uh, local ring aggregator is to collect all the messages that are being uh, sent by all the nodes and come up with something called a score. Um, which is a mathematical formula uh, derived um, from uh, every node's perspective. Let's say you have a 360 node cluster. Um, in Cassandra's point of view, uh, cluster, when you call a cluster is healthy, not when every node is healthy, but every node identifies and sees, communicates with everything, every other nodes in the cluster. So if you're talking about a 300 node cluster, you're talking about 300 times 300 perspectives that are being generated from every node. So that's why there was a uh, humongous amount of data that is being generated uh, from every node, uh, from every region. Uh, so we built a local ring aggregator, uh, with, um, which has a perspective, which has a gossip status, which has a thrift status, all the client protocols, and a heap, uh, you know, network uh, issues, and um, any hardware issues, um, all these being uh, uh, put in something called a score which is a much more minified version of uh, your Cassandra instances health in that region. And these messages are being, uh, these scores are being sent to a something called a centralized global ring aggregator, uh, which collects these scores from every individual regions and uh, come up, uh, builds, uh, evaluates the cluster health based on certain business rules, based on whatever uh, you call a cluster is healthy, um, uh, your definition of healthy, and uh, which runs a finite state machine. The reason we need a finite state machine there is because um, being in a cloud ecosystem, uh, nodes die all the time. When, uh, when a node gets terminated, uh, unlike a stateless machine where when a node gets terminated, new node comes up and it installs all the binaries that you wanted and starts serving the traffic. That doesn't happen in uh, distributed databases like Cassandra. Uh, you need to, uh, that new node, apart from installing binaries, it needs to participate uh, in the gossip, it needs to join the ring, it needs to get petabytes, uh, terabytes of data that it is responsible for, and it needs to slice the token range and get the data. And this all could happen anywhere from several hours to several days. So we have instances where each um, node is um, almost carrying four terabyte of data and transmitting that four terabyte of data from its peers would take anywhere between 24 to 48 hours. So for that 24 to 48 hours, your health check system should not alert you because that node is down. It should detect that there was a termination um, in the cloud and this node is trying to join the ring and um, avoid any false positives. So that is all being uh, all will be handled only when you know the state of a system instead of a you know point in time um, point in time snap s snapshot based health check system. So that is why this global link aggregator has to have something called a finite state machine, which um, has an aware which is aware of uh, all the issues that is that are going in your cluster. So global link aggregator evaluates uh, cluster health and. Uh, produces um, a stream of uh, health check heartbeats. So whether this cluster is healthy or not healthy, every 10, every 10 seconds uh, it uh, produces heartbeats out. Uh, well, we have a good health check system and you know that's great. We have um, the entire uh, fleet of uh, health check encapsulated 
in single um, uh, data stream that is being sent out signals whether the cluster is healthy or not. Uh, but how do we you know visualize it, how, how do we make sense out of it. So that is when we built a system, uh, UI system which uh, subscribes to the data stream that is being uh, emitted by global link aggregator and uh, here I am showing you the macro view where you have uh, thousands of clusters, uh, hundreds of clusters uh, being shown in a hallway dashboards uh, with green, red or you know yellow indicators whether the cluster is healthy or not. And clicking on any of that uh, rectangle box there, uh, basically rectangle the size of the box represents the size of the cluster and clicking on that um, box drills you down to the cluster view where uh, I am showing an example of uh, 36 nodes in one region. Um, this cluster is spanned across three different regions and uh, everything is green which means the cluster is healthy. And clicking on any of the rings gives you the perspective view of the cluster. Again, this is not a stateless machine, this is a stateful machine. You need to have a knowledge of um, the entire gossip and perspective of every node. Uh, every node's perspective about every other node in the cluster. So this uh, uh, this rectangle gives you the representation of um, any gossip issues and any network glitches that we had. So before we had this to figure out if there was any uh, gossip issue in the system, uh, we used to take anywhere between 15 to 30 minutes uh, depending on the cluster size. If it is a three node cluster, you log into three different instances and figure out is every node seeing everyone else uh, the school. But uh, we had uh, clusters with 300 nodes and figuring out which node is missing the view of which other node was a nightmare. So logging into, so we had, um, we had instances where our, uh, you know, on call <coughs> used to log into 100 different instances using all of his shell script and uh, figuring out which node is uh, experiencing the network issue talking to a different node. But all of that was rolled down to uh, less than um, uh, to detect any of the um, gossip issue, uh, we we came down all the way from 30 minutes to a less than minute. Clicking on uh, opening this screen would give you uh, exact uh, representation or exact network glitch, uh, which is happening between uh, you know your data center, between your racks, or between your individual nodes. So what did we gain? Uh, faster detect, uh, faster detection of issues and uh, greater accuracy because it's not a uh, uh, you know point in time <coughs> snap uh, based health check um, your health check as being sent as a, a heartbeat every 10 or 20 seconds so uh, you detect the issues faster and uh, uh, they are much more accurate and um, massive reduction of false positives uh, just to give you the number we had instances of um, 300 uh, uh, pages per day uh, all the way from going down from 300 pages per day to now we have less than 100 pages per week. So that was just because of uh, Mantis based uh, health check system that we rolled out. And also separation of concerns. So when we had uh, our health check, uh, health check system in the past, um, you know, detecting the issue and remediating the issues, everything was, uh, uh, everything was put in the same system. Uh, which was over complicated and then with this uh, streaming based system we you know we made it two different systems where uh, the streaming based system would only detect the issues and then you have your remediation system which auto remediates any other issues um, that are possible. So the next challenge um, that I would tackle uh, is uh, challenge uh, maintenance. So we talked about monitoring and um, what are the known problems with the maintenance when you are running uh, Cassandra at scale? Um, the first would be it's not a stateless uh, system, it's a stateful system, so it needs to persist the state uh, in terms of uh, you know monitoring or in terms of maintenance. And uh, if, you are if you are operating in a cloud ecosystem, your nodes become un uh, unresponsive for no reason because uh, your hardware is not in your control you are being given by uh, your uh, your cloud vendor um, and you do not have any idea of uh, virtualization or uh, physical machines that you are using. And cloud being in cloud ecosystem comes up with its own um, cost, its own problems. So, and also configuration setup and tuning any configurations on uh, 
you know, 20,000 instances would be nightmare with any shell script or any system, uh, with any scripting tools that you come up with. And uh, in Cassandra, token distribution is key. Uh, if you are not using vNodes, uh, which in our case we are not, um, distributing the token equally among uh, all of your data center is important. Otherwise, you would uh, create hotspots in your system which, um, which affects your performance and uh, latencies. And also resilient for any other issues. So when we had uh, S3 outages, when we had any region outages, um, as I said, almost every feature directly or indirectly uh, depends on Cassandra. It's providing resiliency at a data store layer is very critical uh, to keep Netflix up and running all the time. So that is another problem with the res resiliency. So to solve all of these problems, uh, we built a system called Prium. Uh, which rescued, which helps us um, resolving all the issues that we talked about. So uh, let's get into details of um, Priam um, using, uh, you know, building Cassandra in cloud with Priam. So Priam is a sidecar uh, which runs um, on a s on the same instance along with your uh, main data store, with Cassandra. Uh, we use the same sidecar uh, for providing Elasticsearch as a service to provide Dynamite as a service or to provide Zookeeper as a service. So all of our um, CD provided services comes up with the sidecars. And um, in, in case of Priam and Cassandra, um, Priam is mainly re uh, responsible for bootstrapping a cluster, bootstrapping a node, and automated token assignment so that we do not create a hotspots, and backing up the data all the time, and uh, restoring and recovering the data uh, in case of an emergency. <coughs> and also, uh, configuration management uh, across your 10,000 nodes or 20,000 nodes is being done with the help of Priam, and uh, we th which has a Rust API for all of your node tool commands and all of the management um, uh, of m database. And uh, we collect metrics using Cassandra JMX, and uh, uh, heartbeats that I talked about in the health check are being sent from the Priam. So this is a... Uh, high level architecture layout of how we build uh, Cassandra Ring in the cloud, uh, specifically in AWS because we are in AWS. Um, so we have A, B, C, uh, let's call each of those nodes as uh, different regions. So you have one node in one region and uh, the next token would be in a different region and the next token would be in, a, in another different region so that we can have a resiliency uh, I'll get into how we achieve that resiliency across zone, across region outages in next slide. Uh, but each Cassandra instance in uh, AWS would have three processes, uh, two processes running in it. One is the main process Cassandra, and we and also the sidecar called Priam. And um, Priam is, as I said, Priam is responsible for managing the uh, Cassandra, so it's basically babysits Cassandra. So. Uh, this would be the ring output. Um, it's not an empty ring output, but this is how your ring is deployed. So you have, uh, uh, in our example, you have EU West uh, rack 1A, US East 1E, EU West 1B. This is a layout of tokens uh, to achieve the resiliency. Uh, when I share these slides, you can follow the same token distribution, or if you are using Priam, uh, this token distribution is comes to you for free which gives you the resiliency at every layer, every level that we're going to talk about. So uh, with this layout, uh, with this uh, distribution of tokens, we get uh, resiliency at uh, instance level, availability zone level, multiple availability zones level, and region level. So there would be, there would be no incident uh, because of uh, AWS S3 outage, or AWS region outages, or AWS availability zone outages. Regardless of any of those outages, Cassandra would be up and running uh, because of how we deployed uh, with the help of Priam. So how do we sustain um, uh, instance um, outages? So uh, most of our data is um, replicated with uh, replication factor three, and uh, we deploy Cassandra in three different availability zones within a region. So, and the way we distribute a token across three availability zones gives us um, flexibility that uh, when you insert a record, uh, it would be inserted in three 
available three different availability zones no matter what so even if one availability zone goes away or even if one node goes away you have two other availability zones and two other instances which holds the same record so that way you get um, uh, instance level resiliency and uh, we use um, prem uh, prem bootstraps cassandra uh, in terms of uh, instance instance being terminated or instance being replaced and um, uh, that is all automated through Preem. So when a new node comes up, Preem bootstraps and figures out whether that Cassandra instance needs to be replaced or bootstrapped and does that automatically. And uh, resilience, how do we provide resilience at uh, available one availability zone? Again, uh, it's just because uh, replication factor is three and we deploy it in three different availability zones. Um, so even if the entire availability zone goes away, you have two different availability zones which is serving your traffic. And we have um, Chaos Kong uh, exercises, which takes away instances all the time, which takes away availability zones all the time. Uh, but Cassandra would not be impacted. I mean, not even 99th latencies would be impacted when your Chaos Kong exercise is going away. So, and also another key important uh, thing here uh, to sustain uh, availability zone outages is uh, if your cluster is 99th latency sensitive, and um, even if even in case of an emergency, even in case of the entire availability zone going away, if you don't want your 99th latencies to be impacted, uh, you are you need to provision cluster at two third capacity because um, when the entire availability zone goes away, you have one less of an instance to serve the same token range, and uh, your uh, uh, your traffic could be distributed only among two instances that are out there. So uh, it's always good to provision uh, with two-third capacity so that it can sustain any zone outages as well. And uh, because we um, provision at two-third capacity, we do take uh, zone uh, maintenances all the time. Let's say if there is a restart or if there's an upgrade, we take down the entire zone and upgrade and bring it back up without impacting any live traffic. Uh, how do we sustain uh, multiple availability zone outage? Um, it depends on the usage uh, of the cluster. If you are using uh, uh, local quorum application, if your application is using local quorum, uh, we cannot sustain multiple availability zones. So that is when we fail over the traffic to a different region uh, because that region would have the same data and can take your traffic. But if your application is using a local one, then we do sustain multiple availability zone outages. And that depends on application to application. So how do we um, sustain from uh, region failures? So in case of any connectivity issues between the regions or uh, you know, AWS region going away, our traffic team uh, shifts the traffic to a different region, and which has all the data all the time, because we do run repair frequently, and we do keep uh, our data center in, um, you know, consistent with the other data centers so that uh, we can have the data across three different uh, three different regions. Um, so we talked about uh, maintenance and monitoring. So to get around with the monitoring issues, we built a system called Mantis-based health check system. Uh, to make our maintenance life easier, we built a sidecar called Prem. And uh, how do we solve open source product challenges when you are running in a production, when you are running at scale? Just to give you the snapshot, uh, this is, uh, I think, yesterday's snapshot of Cassandra open issues uh, across uh, several releases. And um, as you can see, you have uh, um, so many issues coming up every week. And um, the best way to support your open source product in production is to have Apache committers in your team and keep looking at your, keep, uh, you know, keep an eye on the Jira, keep an eye on the product all the time. And uh, when you are using open source product, um, driving the product uh, vision also comes to your responsibility. Because based on your needs, based on your requirement, you would direct, um, you know, you would talk in uh, Jira, you would talk in conversations, uh, and then come up with the new features and uh, make, future, make the product better. So how do we certify and um, do the benchmarking um, for open source product like Cassandra? and make it production ready. So that is when we built a system called NDBench, uh, Netflix Data Benchmarking. Um, so Netflix Data NDBench is a pluggable uh, cloud-enabled uh, 
uh, benchmarking tool that can be used to benchmark, uh, uh, be it your Cassandra, Elasticsearch, or any persistent <coughs> store that is out there. And the reason we built uh, NDBench, uh, because we looked at um, uh, open source products out there. We looked at um, you know Yahoo, Cloud Benchmarking, and many other be uh, Puff testing tools. Uh, but we were mainly looking at something which is which can be very close to production, which is um, uh, which Im simulates and uh, imitates your production traffic, uh, not by just uh, replaying the traffic, but uh, actually generating the production traffic. Uh, so one of the key things there would be dynamic benchmark configurations. For example, if you are running a benchmarking for six hours, you might not be able to reproduce um, any memory leak issues that are happening in your system. So let's say uh, you're trying to reproduce a uh, memory leak that is happening uh, in your production system. So you tried it for six hours, then your, your uh, benchmarking stops there, and you can't reproduce because that memory leak might happen only after running it for two days or three days. That you never know unless you reproduce it. So then uh, to repro the same problem, you would take several days to figure out when that, actually, when that memory leak is actually happening. Uh, so that is when, when you have something like um, NDBench, which allows you to dynamically, you know, tune your configurations, uh, which is similar to your production environment, where um, you have traffic going up and down. You know, during the peak hours it goes up, and during non-peak hours your traffic goes down. And maybe due to some, uh, you know, traffic behavior, there is a memory leak, which you cannot reproduce when you have a constant traffic coming in. So that is when you come up with, uh, you know. These, um, you know, you you tune the configuration while the load is running. You let it run for the days, weeks, months. It doesn't matter. It runs as if there is a production traffic coming into your system, and then you can tune the configuration as you do in the production, and you introduce the pattern, a different load pattern, and then uh, it would be easy for you to repro any any of such issues. And also be able to integrate with the rest of the cloud systems. So typical problems with the um, uh, benchmarking tools would be running on a different machines. They do not share the same uh, ecosystem that your production system is sharing. They do not co-host other services that are running out there. As a result, you won't be able to deploy the problem all the time. And uh, with the NDBench, we solve that. Um, ND, when the NDBench is uh, running on any eco uh, in any cloud-based instance, it would be as close, I mean, as close as it can to any production instance. It would have same sidecars running. It would have same uh, other services um, that are running in your production system, so that it would be easy for you to repro any issues. And uh, it provides a uh, pluggable patterns in terms of you know random pattern or uh, you know Netflix traffic pattern or Netflix offline batch processing pattern, and generate the load uh, the way you want. And it supports uh, different client APIs because we have different uh, persistent stores uh, to be benchmarked. So we made it uh, pluggable so that um, it can support any different client API. So out of box, we have Cassandra, Dynamite, Elasticsearch, and Alessandra as uh, plugins that are available there. But you can pretty much uh, write a plugin for any of uh, client uh, that you are trying and uh, start using it. So we use NDBench at Netflix as a benchmarking tool. We use it in part of uh, integration test. We use it as part of deployment valid validation as well. So for example, when you use uh, NDBench as um, part of you know benchmarking, so here is a uh, snapshot of um, Cassandra 2.0 versus 2.1 reads on Thrift. Uh, as you can see, um, you know the blue one is uh, 2.0, and uh, I think the purple or red one is 2.1. So this gives you side-by-side -side comparison of different versions that, that are out there, or different uh, different drivers that you are trying, or different uh, environment. Maybe it is uh, on a Linux, or maybe Ubuntu, or whatever. You can have this side-by-side -side comparison with the help of NDBench. And b right after you run this performance benchmarking tool, it would be easy for you to take a decision whether to go forward with the new release of Cassandra, or new release of uh, Cassandra Java driver, or whatever. As part of uh, certification, so every AMI that we bake, uh, since we are in AWS and ecosystem, every AMI that we bake goes through uh, NDBench uh, performance test suite. And based on the result, only we promote that AMI to be production ready. And um, typical um, problems that people 
turn into when they are building a benchmarking tools is that benchmarking tool itself puts a lot of overhead. As a result, you would not be measuring the numbers properly. So, but as you can see, um, with um, you know with ND Bench, we were able to generate millions of operations per second, uh, which are under several nan uh, several um, milliseconds. Like so, th in this example, uh, Dynamite was generating uh, with hundred microseconds. So. Uh, which clearly shows ND Bench doesn't put any overhead as a tool itself uh, to measure your performance. Uh, I'm not talking more about ND Bench. Uh, this is a, a Apache licensed open source project. You can find it out on our um, uh, GitHub, Netflix GitHub. And uh, stitching it all together to provide Cassandra as a service at Netflix, this is how our architecture looks like. Um, every Cassandra instance is um, having three different processes that are running. You have uh, Mantis-based health check. Uh, Winston is our uh, auto remediation system, which is again open sourced. You can look at our uh, Netflix uh, tech blog, which talks about Winston. We have uh, Unomia, which is uh, uh, which is the you know advisory or the governor to monitor all of our production fleet. And uh, as you can see, all these events are being sent through our alert system, Atlas, which is our uh, metric system, are being auto remediated by Winston automatically and uh, we use Jenkins for some of our maintenance and uh, we have capacity prediction to predict the um, traffic to predict the uh, you know to predict the usage pattern of uh, any Cassandra instance we have uh, we have outlier detections we have forklifter tools and um, we have log analysis which is uh, ELK based and um, we a uh, CDE person gets paged only after going through several of these systems when none of these systems cannot solve the issue, that is when we get paged. With that, I'm opening up for questions. And uh, I think we have five more minutes. And uh, yes, we do. Netflix is hiring. Um, Jobs.netflix.com. And these are the two opening positions in our team. If you want to work in you know, this kind of architecture-based systems, please reach out to me. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, how did you design the finite state machine that you mentioned before? So uh, that we used uh, Mantis, our uh, streaming-based system. And we came up with all the business logic that we gained over the several years of running Cassandra's service. And that is how we decided what makes sense to page uh, CDE or to page uh, auto remediation to system uh, to, to take an action on Cassandra. Okay, so the question is um, in uh, health check system, where do local aggregator and global link aggregator store their state? So that is given by Mantis framework. So Mantis framework holds uh, the data in their uh, uh, in their ecosystem, and um, they, it uh, it also has a checkpointing system which uh, checkpoints to HDFS, S3, and uh, several other data stores. Uh, but that comes from a streaming service offering that we have. Uh, you can uh, simulate this in Spark streaming environment as well. Uh, if you write a window-based or uh, time window-based uh, job in uh, <coughs> Spark streaming, uh, that I think you can come up with uh, different persistent stores. Uh, so this quarter we are releasing, uh, we are open sourcing Mantis. Uh, in that open source blog, we'll talk about more on how these jobs persist the state and all that stuff. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned that you don't use Yes. So when we tried vNodes, uh, I'm talking about uh, two, and two years back when they released. Um, so the resiliency that we were talking about, instance availability zone resiliency, uh, the way vNodes distributes their tokens uh, was not aware of availability zones and regions. So we had instances where same availability zone had uh, uh, replication, replicated tokens. As a result, if you, when you take the availability zone uh, out of the picture, you have a token range of lane exception. As a result, you have a downtime in Cassandra. That is when we decided not to use vNodes. But at current state of vNodes, uh, I know a lot of token distributed algorithms have been improved in vNodes. I don't know the current state, uh, but we might revisit in future. Yes? So when you deploy your uh, Cassandra, do you deploy to bare metal in your own data centers or onto VMs, or how does that, how does that work? 
which, so uh, which operating system do you yeah so netflix is i think 100% is on aws we don't have any uh, bare metal or any of our data center so we deploy it in i2 based instances and mostly 95% on i2 based instances i2 2xl i2 4xl and i2 x 8xl in terms of aws terminology um, on Ubuntu. Ubuntu? Yeah. Okay. We run on Linux, but we migrated to Ubuntu. Yes? Yeah, you mentioned the capacity prediction. Correct. Uh, do you uh, extend capacity automatically, or uh, it's manual job? Uh, like yeah. So today, we have automated bots, uh, which are keeping an eye on our usage and uh, prediction. So we automated, uh, I would say, 20% of um, auto-scaling, um, where it is so obvious that you need to you know extend the cluster you need to add nodes to the cluster but as you know the problems with the cassandra doubling and process it takes you know several months depends on our data sizes we haven't automated it 100% uh, but we are in the process of automating that as well okay cool. um, thank you very much thank you